Amen. That's good news, man. Yeah. Let's pray together. Jesus, we're grateful, God, that, um, man, I love that line in Never Ending Will that says that you sought us out. Lord, that we, uh, we weren't not, not just stranded trying to kind of find our way to you. God, that you, you came, you sent Jesus. God, so in the midst of the, the junk that we have that in our lives, Lord, just because we're sinful people, God, you said, man, I want, I want you as my own. I'm going to seek you out and set you free. God, thanks so much, Lord, just that we talked about, Lord. We get to be a part of the stuff that you're doing, Lord. Not only in our lives, God, but, but in the lives around us, Lord, seeing you work, Lord, that's a testimony to who you are. God, so as we, as we look into your word this morning, and as we look into what it means to, to love our neighbor, Lord, and to, to be those people that actually seek others out like you sought us out, and help us to have ears that are open and hearts that are ready to, to learn. I say all this in your name, Jesus. Take a seat. Hey, good morning, everybody. It's so good to see you this morning. And, uh, man, it is great. Look around. If you haven't just taken a look around, just peek around and look. It is awesome to see our faith family worshiping together this morning and being outside on a nice day. And so we're so thankful that you're here. If you're a guest with us today, thank you so much for being part of our worship service. We hope you have a great time and, uh, and that God just touches your heart this morning as we uh, have a chance to worship together. And so here's something that we love to do. If you're new to our church, we celebrate the reading of the Word of God together. And so if you have your Bibles this morning. Turn to Luke chapter 10 with us. And as we jump into Luke chapter 10 this morning, we are finishing up a teaching series called The Main Thing. And so I want you to hear from uh, from Luke what takes place uh, in verse 25 as you look at Luke chapter 10. So here's what happens. It says, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, what is written in the law? Jesus replied, how do you read it? And he answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied, do this and you will live. So I want us to stop there for just a second and I want to get this because the, the lawyer is asking a great question. And if you haven't asked this question, you need to really hear what's going on in this passage because he's asking a really phenomenal question. He says, here, Jesus, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? In other words, this guy is thinking about his future. He believes and knows that this life is not all that there is, that there is an eternity to come, and that eternity has consequences. Either that you're going to be with God forever or you're going to be separated from God forever. And so this guy looks at Jesus and says, hey, I've got a question, and I think this is an important question. What do I have to do to inherit eternal life? And so he's thinking about having eternal life. Now, if, if this is kind of a cool, I love what our church is kind of doing, and I know already today we've asked you to pull out your phones. Most churches are like, hey, put your phones away in church. Pay attention to what's going on. But if you want to take notes today on the app for our Grace Fellowship page, you can take some notes, write some things in. So go back to the app if you want to. But here's the question that's being asked. How do I know I'm going to heaven when I die? Like, how do I know? And this isn't an assumption. This is something he wants to know, to be certain about, to have full knowledge and awareness of. See, a lot of people assume they're going to heaven, right? Maybe you've had conversations with people throughout your life, and they just assume, well, when I die, I'm going to heaven. And if you go, why do you think that? They may have all kinds of reasons. Well, I mean, my parents grew up taking me to church. I've always been around church, so I think I'm going to heaven when I die. Or I've been a really good person. I think I've done more good things than bad things. So I'll probably go to heaven when I die. Or I belong to a certain religion or a certain faith practice. And so I'll probably go to heaven when I die. And the assumption is I'm going to get there. I'm going to make it. But the honest question is how do I know? How do I know? And if you had to turn that question in on yourself this morning, would you be able to answer that question and say, do I assume that I'm going to heaven when I die? Because a lot of people assume that our loved ones have already passed and we just assume, well, they made it. But if you ask, why do you think that your loved one made it? Again, it goes back to, well, they were a certain religion or they were a certain faith practice or they, they were good people or they went to church. And the honest truth is, is we have to know more than just an assumption about if we're gonna make it or not. Assumptions about future reservations can get you into big trouble. I don't know if you've ever assumed something about a future event, but it can get you in big trouble. I can remember in my life uh, in high school, 
uh, there was a girl that I really liked in, in our youth group. And I wanted to take her out on a date. We'd been good friends for a while, but I really wanted to ask her out and maybe take the relationship to the next level of not friendship, but maybe dating relationship. And we had, I just, I'd always liked this girl a lot. And so I asked her out on a date. By the way, I didn't tell my wife I was going to tell this story this morning. So this is brand new information. All right. Um, so uh, anyway, when, when we did this whole thing, I, saw, I decided, you know, what's the most, what's the most romantic way to, to win a girl's heart? Well, you ask her out on Valentine's Day, right? And so I asked this girl out on Valentine's Day. And I said, I, you, she loved Japanese steakhouse, these kind of places that you go, and they cook the food right in front of you. And so I thought, all right, we're going to drive to Knoxville, and we're going to go to this Japanese steakhouse that her parents had told me that she really liked on Valentine's Day. <laughs> and I didn't make a reservation <laughs> because I was in high school. I didn't know Valentine's Day was a big deal. I mean, I'm 38 now, and I still am not real sure why Valentine's Day is a big deal. But anyway, um, we do. That's why I don't do well in marriage most of the time. And, um, but anyway, we, we drive all the way to Knoxville and we get there and I walk in and there's all these people sitting waiting inside outside of the restaurant. There's all these people sitting and waiting and, and I'm looking around and my heart just drops. And I'm like, oh no, there's a problem. So we go in and I ask whoever this person is at the table, hey, we'd like to make a reservation for two. Um, how long is the wait? She's like about two and a half hours. So I go, oh, no, two and a half hours, that's crazy. See, I had assumed we would just get to the restaurant and walk right in, maybe wait for a little while, get a table, eat dinner, have a nice meal, and our relationship would just take off. That didn't happen because where we ended up eating dinner that night was at Shoney's down the street because we couldn't wait two and a half hours. I still had a curfew. <laughs> and so we're like, we got to drive back from Knoxville. So we, we ended up at Shoney's, right? And that was the last date. And that was it. We were done after that. <laughs> All because a bad assumption can leave you in big trouble. And if you're assuming that you're going to get to heaven when you die because of your goodness, because of your faith background, because of your family, because of something else that you believe. Whatever it is your assumption is, this lawyer asks Jesus a great question. How can I know? And so Jesus, being brilliant, he kind of turns the, the question on the lawyer. And but before we look at that, I want to kind of make sure we get to this, that the most important day of our life is the day that's still in front of us. Right? In fact, the most important day of our life is the day that we're going to die. Because on the day that we die, that's such an important day because at that moment, regardless of what you believe about eternity, maybe you're here today and you go, I don't even, I don't even think that's a real thing. Like, I think we're just going to die and then we're in the ground and worms eat us and that's it. It's just nothingness after that. Or maybe you do believe in eternity, but you're not so sure about hell. Everybody's going to heaven. But here's what I know. On the day you die, it's the most important day because on that day, you will find out for sure what happens in eternity. And so you've got to be prepared for that day. You've got to be prepared for that moment with something more than an assumption that you want to know what happens on that day. On the most important day of my life, on the day that I die, what happens? And so this guy asked Jesus, what's the most important thing? How do I know I'm going to heaven? And Jesus says, well... Let's flip the question a little bit. I'm going to ask you. You're a lawyer. You know the law of God. How do you read it? And so this guy goes, okay, well, I, I read it this way. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, that's a great answer. In fact, Jesus validates the guy. He goes, you, you've got it right. If you do those things you will live. Not just live a good life here, live eternally. Now, I want to make sure we point something out this morning. This is before Jesus goes to the cross and dies for our sins. This is when the law was what our relationship with God was built on. And so Jesus said to this guy, if you keep the law, love God with everything you have in you, all your heart, soul, mind, strength, love your neighbor as yourself, work out your faith of, in God through the way you deal with people and interact with people. If you can do that, then you'll show your love for God is genuine, hope-filled love for God. You'll keep the law. You'll keep the commandments. But here's what we know now. Jesus came to this earth to be the way that we have that relationship with God. And so Jesus said in John, if you have your Bibles and want to flip over with me just for a second, John chapter 14. John 
John chapter 14, verses 6 and 7, Jesus answered and said, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. And so Jesus is basically saying from this point forward, because I've come from the Father and I represent the Father and I and the Father am one, I've come so that you can have life, but the only way to have life is through me. I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one gets to the Father unless they come through me. So before Jesus came, obedience to the law, love God, love people. That was how you did it. After Jesus came, he said, you still love God and love people, but here's how you love God. You love God through a relationship with Jesus. Jesus is the door through which we have a personal relationship with God and that we find our eternal state with him in heaven. And then as we learn to love God with everything that we have in us through this relationship with Jesus, we will also work that out in the way that we love people, in the way that we engage our community, our neighborhoods, our world. And so as we do all of these things, we start to see what Jesus is pointing at is the fact that we've got to do the main thing. Now, Back in Luke chapter 10, when you see this, you start to see that this man wanted to ask Jesus this question because he wanted to validate himself. He wanted to vindicate himself. In fact, Luke tells us in Luke chapter 10 the reasoning behind this man's question. He, uh, he says that the lawyer asked to test Jesus. And so he wanted to be validated. When Jesus told him he answered correctly, he said, do this and you'll live. But the man wanted to justify himself, verse 29. So he asked Jesus, okay, then who's my neighbor? Apparently he thought he was doing pretty good on the love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength thing. But he said, all right, the, the thing I'm having a really hard time with Jesus is then who's my neighbor? Who should I love? Who do I show the love of God to? If I love God with everything that I have, how do I work that out toward loving other people? And so as Jesus gets to this moment, he's going to look at this guy and he's going to give him uh, an understanding about what this looks like because through our love for Jesus, he's going to change our hearts toward people. And as we learn to love God, he's going to change our hearts toward people. But a love for God without a love for people, and if you're taking notes and want to write this in on your app, here's the next thing on your outline. A love for God without a love for people is a misguided understanding of what it means to be a follower of Christ. To think that I can segregate those two things and say, well, I'll love God with everything that I have in me, but I don't really think I'm going to pay attention to people that well. I'm not going to love them. Or I'm going to love people really well, but it's all going to be about me. It's not built out of the love that, that I have for God. You start to separate those two things, and Jesus says, you've got a misguided understanding of what it means to be a follower of Christ. You've got to do both of these things. The main thing is a two-part thing. Love God and love people. We have to do both or we miss understand what it means to be a follow-up question. So the lawyer asks the follow-up question. Then who's my neighbor? And here's what he's getting around to because the question behind the question is this. He's asking how little can I do and still be obedient to God? What's the bare minimum that I have to do to show that I love God with all my heart and I love my neighbor as myself. So who's my neighbor? What's, who are the, the few people, Jesus, that I need to recognize as my neighbor? Is it the people in the front row right here? The back row people don't count? Is it the, you know, the people who live on the either side of me in a house beside me? Is it the people that I work with? Who's my neighbor? How do I express this love for Jesus? And so here's the next two things on your outline. The lawyer was looking for minimal obedience but Jesus always requires absolute obedience. And so when the lawyer asks this question, hey, who's my neighbor? He's saying, what's the least I can do and get away with showing God's love to people around me? But Jesus is going to tell a story that's going to illustrate who his neighbor is. And so here's what I'm going to need this morning. We've got kids in our audience today, and you guys are doing an incredible job. Thank you guys so much. Hey, adults, let's give them a, job, a hand for doing a great job listening in this morning. So some kids, here's what I'm going to need from you. I need, if you're in like third grade and under, can you guys come up here and help me out with something? I'm going to tell a little story, and I need your help. So I need some people, if you're in third grade or under, just come up here and stand beside me. Come on, kids. You guys encourage them to come on up. All right, and then I also need, um, let's see, uh, Crow, I need you. Come on up here, man. I talked to you earlier today. You come on up. And um, where's Nate? Where you? No, Nate's not here. Where did I, who else did I talk to? My boy, Drew. Where's Miller? Where's Drew? Drew, come on up here, buddy. I need you too. All right, kids. Hey, you guys are looking awesome. 
Everybody doing good? Yeah. Hey, do you see that little thing right there, that little black thing? That's a camera. People are watching us at home. Can you guys yell at them and wave and cheer and clap and stuff for them? They want to see you guys this morning, all right? All right, fantastic. <laughs> hey, here's what I need you guys to do. Can you guys, like, sneak around the back side of this thing over here? And I'm going to give you some instructions in just a second. Just sneak over that way just a little bit. All right. Um, come here, Mr. Crow. Jesus is going to tell a story, so let me go ahead and tell this story just a little bit. Luke chapter 10. The man wanted to justify himself. He asked, who's my neighbor? And in reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he was attacked by robbers. So this is our man. Mr. Crow, come on up here, buddy. This is our traveler. This is a Jewish guy on his way from Jerusalem to Jericho, or vice versa. And so here's what I need. Hey, kids, can y'all still hear me back there? Do you guys see this guy right here? Hey, here's what you don't know. Your job this morning is you guys are a, a band of thieves and robbers. Did you know that? And do you know what? Do you know you, you want to be a cop? No, you're going to be a robber this morning, all right? But I like your moral compass. I like where your life is headed. But here's what's going to happen. I need you guys to just come up here, and can you act like... I don't need you to take, like, all your frustrations on your parents out, but can you act like... You're beating up Mr. Crow right here. Can you guys come up here and just give him a good, maybe some kicks in the shins or punch on the gut or something? You guys come on up here. We've got our gang that comes and attacks him. Come on. Come on, Ainsley. Give him some punches. Oh, Grayson, I knew you'd be the first one. My son. Don't, don't really hurt him. Just, just pretend punches. Pretend punches. All right, good. Anybody else want to get a hit in on him? All right, there you go. That was a good one. Okay, we beat him down. All right, he's down. All right, now, you guys have stolen all this stuff. Go back and sit down and share everything you stole with your parents. Great job. All right. The, the, the pastor's kid was the one who had the stick and was beating people up. That's awesome. Headed for a life of crime right there. All right, so we've got our beaten up guy over here. And so here's what I need next. Um, Jesus tells this story, and he says that the man was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes. You're welcome that we didn't do that part of the story. They stripped him of his clothes. They beat him. We did that part. And then they went away, leaving him half dead. Now, um, he left. There he is. Hey, uh, Matt, I need you now, buddy. Matt is one of our pastors here. He's our children's pastor. And uh, the Bible says, Jesus tells the story and says that a priest came by. The priest, he didn't, the priest didn't kick him. All right. So it tells the story. It says that a priest happened by. He happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So can you give him like the germaphobe, hoity-toity, snooty, you don't want anything to do with him, just pass by on the other side. You're just going to leave him. Yes, very self-righteous. Good. Matt's had lots of practice with self-righteousness, you can tell. It's good. <laughs> All right, and so then it says the next person who came by. Now, the, the priests were the guys. They were the, the spiritual leaders. These guys were the ones who were like the pastors for Israel, and, and the nation trusted in these guys. And so he's probably on his way to Jerusalem to go to the temple and to serve. And he knows that by touching a dead body, he thinks the guy could be dead, that he disqualifies himself for being in service at the temple. This is only opportunity that, that season to, to be in service in the temple. It was part of how he, he helped feed his family and took care of the spiritual needs of the community. And so we give these guys a bad rap, but in some way he's passing by because he's trying to watch out for the bigger picture. Well, the Bible says then, and Jesus tells the story that a Levite then came along. Kyle, why don't you help me? You guys give Kyle a hand. He led us in worship this morning. And Kyle, come from this way too. The Levites... The Levites, actually, you know what, before you do that, come here, let me, let me do something oh real fast. Goodness. The Levites, I didn't practice this story before we started, all right? The Levites were the worship leaders for Israel, right? These guys were given a special uh, place in God's kingdom and in his fellowship within the nation to lead the Israelites in worship. And so these Levites were guys that, that they had been training to serve in the temple, to lead the people in worship, to, to bring them before God in his presence. And Kyle does an incredible job with that. I hope you guys have recognized Kyle's gifted leadership in that. He's been here a couple of times over the last few weeks, and uh, it's really cool that he has been. And here's what's really, really cool about this. Today I get to make a special announcement that Kyle's actually joining our staff team as our worship <laughs> And so uh, Kyle and his wife, Micah, and their eight-month-old eight-month-old little girl, Annalise, are going to be moving up here in August and joining our staff team. He's going to be our worship pastor, and so we're so excited to have you, man, and welcome to our faith family as part of that. So now you get to be back in the story, so go around over there. All right, and you're going to follow the example of the priest. You're going to pass by, and you're going to see the guy and go, well, you know what? If the priest didn't help, 
then I don't have two of you. So if you want to kind of skip on by or do whatever it is that you do in your skinny jeans to do that, man, I mean, I'm not sure the Levites had that problem going for them, but 21st century worship leaders right there, all right? And so, well, yeah, welcome to our faith family, buddy. Um, but here's what it says next, that uh, then a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and he saw him, and he took pity on him. So, man, Drew's going to be our Samaritan today. He's a good guy. He's really happy, dude. And so why don't you go and you tell, tell, take care of him over there, bandage his wounds, pour some oil and wine on him if you've got some in your pocket there, whatever you're carrying around with you. But he's going to just kind of take care. Oh, I missed a part. Hey, is Josh. Where's Josh? Josh, come here, man. I missed a part. I forgot this part. Here's the next thing Jesus says. He took pity on him. He bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey. Come over here, buddy. And if you can help him get on Josh's back, and he'll, you guys will ride off into the sunset. And uh, there you go. Just jump on. Yeah, there you go. All right, give them a hand. That's fantastic. Good stuff. Aren't you glad you came to church this morning? It's good, isn't it? It says this, then he, he put the man on his own donkey. He brought him to an inn, and he took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii, which in that day and time, that was about a day's wages for a laborer. He took out two denarii, and he gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. So which of these three men do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? And the expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Now, this would have been a problematic story in this day. And it would have been a really problematic thing for Jesus to ask the lawyer this question. Hey, who do you think was the hero in this story? And for the lawyer to have to say the Samaritan. I don't know if you noticed or not, but he didn't even say the Samaritan. He said, I guess the one who showed mercy. He didn't even want to mention the Samaritans by names because the Jews and the Samaritans, they didn't get along. They hated each other. And so this guy goes, well, the, the one who showed compassion, the one who showed mercy. And so Jesus says, that's how you're supposed to act as a person who loves God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And if you're going to love your neighbor as yourself, who's your neighbor? It's even the people you might consider to be an enemy. Even the ones that you won't call out by name. Even the ones that you wouldn't have dinner with the ones you wouldn't invite to your house right now. He says, those are the people in this world that when you start to think about what it means to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself, who's my neighbor? Everyone is. Everyone's my neighbor. Now, the thing that I love about this story is it includes a man that was beaten half dead. And when you see this, there are several people who walk by and they just leave him. The robbers, they didn't have any regard for this man. They, they're the ones that beat him that way. Then the priest came along. He doesn't have any regard for the guy. He's more in, in, in tune with going and loving God than he is loving his neighbor. The Levite comes along. He's more in tune with going and loving God and showing his love for God than he is loving his neighbor. But the, the Samaritan comes along and says, I can do both. I have a love for God that's causing me to go and show compassion for my neighbor. But guys, here's what I want to focus on just for the last few minutes that we're together this morning is this, that the half-beaten dead man in the story is right here among us today and will be this afternoon when people from our community come to celebrate part of Fun Fest and, and to give their time today to eat at the food trucks and, and to play games that we're going to set up. There are going to be people who are going to come to this place today and whether we recognize it or not right now, the Bible says that they are spiritually dead, lost in their sins outside of a relationship with God. And so one of the things that we have to constantly do as followers of Christ is be able to look around, not in a judgmental way, but in a loving, compassionate, merciful way, and say, do I recognize that in my interactions at work, when I go out to meals, when I'm in my neighborhood, that there are people around me who, even though they're physically alive, they're spiritually dead. They don't have a relationship with God. And so if I love God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love my neighbor as myself, what's the most compassionate thing I can do for a neighbor that I recognize has spiritual death inside of them? Am I going to be the priest and Levite and walk on by and just go, well, somebody else will take care of that? I'm sure somebody will share the story of Jesus with them. Or will we be like the Good Samaritan who sees the person in their need, 
who stops and offers the one thing that can bring them health and bring them life. Gordon and Varenka talked about their trip to, to El Salvador, where they're going to be going as the hands and feet of Jesus to show mercy to people in a medical sense, that they're going to literally be doing medical things to help people out. But in our case, maybe it's not the medical situation that's the biggest need for people around us. The spiritual need is by far the biggest need. And so we as followers of Christ have to be tuned in to recognize and be aware that there are people in our community that are going to be with us today, maybe are here with us even right now. That you're listening to this and you're going, I know inside of me I don't have a relationship with Jesus. I don't have spiritual life. And you need that. And so the best thing we can possibly do this morning is tell you what's the most important thing. The most important thing for you to do is to have a personal relationship with Jesus. And today when we leave from here and, and go and, and eat at the food trucks and go and serve with the games that we're going to do, I want to encourage us not to be so preoccupied with other things that we miss our responsibility to love our neighbors. So it can be easy to come here and say, I love God with all my heart. I love to sing his songs. I love to read his word. I love to pray to him. I love to hear stories of what, people, what God's doing in people's lives. But beyond that, how are we going to tangibly show love to people in our community? And so one of the ways that we've been encouraging you as over the last three weeks to do that is to just try to find ways today as you're hanging around and as you're engaging with people, try to find opportunities and ways today to build relationships with people. Introduce yourself to someone you don't know. Sit down at a table when people start to eat and just have a meal with people. Introduce yourself. Offer to buy somebody's lunch if you want to, whatever it looks like. But in the middle of sitting down, would you maybe just take an opportunity to ask the person, hey, can I just ask you a question? What's the most important thing in your life? See, I, I love how Jesus' interaction with the, the lawyer went. When the man said, hey, what's the most important thing? How do I know that I'm going to heaven when I die. Jesus turned the question back on him and he said, well, you know the law. How do you read it? And I love what Jesus does in that. And it's an important way for us to think about sharing our faith. Jesus gives the guy an opportunity, whether he's right or wrong, to share his experience. And the guy actually gave the right answer. Love God, love people. And Jesus said, yep, you're right. What if the guy had said, don't murder people? Jesus would have probably gone, that's a great opinion. Can I share with you what I think the most important law is, the Bible says to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. See, the great thing about this kind of interaction is that you can put the ball in someone else's court and say, what do you believe? What's your most important thing? What's primary to you? And guess what? There's no wrong answer for them in that moment because whatever they say is honest and true. Uh, football is the most important thing in my life. I live it, breathe it, dream it, right? That's it. Work, the most important thing in my life. I'm all about making as much money as I possibly can. Uh, family, most important thing in my life. I'm all about my family. I do anything for my family. So when you have these conversations today, and hopefully you will just be able to ask and say, hey, what, what's the most important thing in your life? And regardless of what someone answers, you can go, man, that's, that's great. Thanks for sharing that with me. Could, could I share with you the most important thing in my life? Because the most important thing in my life is a personal relationship with Jesus. He's changed me. Would you mind if I tell you a little bit about that relationship that I have? And maybe they'll say yes, and you'll have an opportunity to share your faith. Maybe they'll say no, and you go, okay, hey, thanks. Enjoy your chicken and waffles or whatever the food trucks bring today, right? But whatever it is that we have an opportunity to say, how do we engage with people? How do we ask them? How do we find out what's the main thing? So I want to challenge you today. For a lot of us, myself included, this is a step outside of your comfort zone. So you want me to, to sit down and talk face-to-face -face with a person I don't know and ask them what's the most important thing in their life? Yeah. Yeah, let's do that. Let, let's try. Let's see what God does. Let's see what doors are opened up for us maybe to share the love of Jesus with people today. And then we'll just see how God responds and how people respond. And it could very well be today that someone will walk from death to spiritual life and that you could play an instrum, instrum, instrumental part in that. And so we're going to pray together, and then Kyle's going to lead us again. But as we pray, we're just going to pray over our day. I hope you'll stick around for the afternoon, hang out with us, set up some games, play. But the most important thing I hope we'll do today is try to meet people, engage with our community, 
show the love of Jesus in the ways that we serve and in the tangible things that we do and in the conversations that we have, all right? And if this morning, as you've been listening, maybe God's stirring something inside of you right now to say, I'm not a believer in Jesus. I, he is not the main thing in my life. He is not the most important thing in my life. If that's true, then before you leave here this morning, I'd love to have a personal conversation with you. Just come find me. I'll be hanging around. Uh, or Matt, you can talk with him, Andy, any of our elders, anybody that you're here with. If you came as a guest with somebody, just say, hey, you, can you tell me? Tell me about your relationship with Jesus. We'd love to have that conversation with you. All right? Let's pray together. Well, Heavenly Father, you're so good to us, and we love you. And we're grateful for the opportunity that we have to gather here to worship, to serve. To, to not only express our love for you today, God, but that we also get to express our love for people in a tangible way to, to serve our community and to set up games and to activities for kids and, and adults and to engage in conversation with people and just to, to fellowship, to hang out, and to just be, be people who show the love of Christ right here in our community. We're grateful for that opportunity. Thank you for, uh, for a city that allows us a chance to have an open worship service and invite people to come and attend and then to to be a church who leads out in games for our community. We're, we're grateful, God, for, for partnership uh, relationships like that. And we're, we're grateful that you've, you're doing things not only through us, but other churches around this area. As other churches are gathering to worship today, the, the name of Jesus is being held high and people are being exposed to the truth and they're hearing the gospel. And so we're grateful for our brothers and sisters and, and the churches in this town that are, that are holding out the name of Jesus to people who may be lost and dead in their sin this morning. And I pray, God, that we would be willing to ask that same question. What is the most important thing? And how do I know? How do I know I'm going to heaven when I die? How do I know I have a relationship with God through his son, Jesus? And if we don't know, God, I pray that today that no one would leave this place without having a conversation with someone and saying, tell me more about what it means to be a follower of Christ. God, we love you. We trust you. We praise you. And we ask these things in your holy, precious name.